Hi everybody. The purpose of um, these next uh, 20 minutes or so here, maybe 30 depending on how long it takes, maybe 15 depending on how short it takes, um, is to give you guys a basic intro into um, the very beginning of your, where we're going to begin European and Latin American history and our like kind of online distance learning part. And, and the way it's going to work is this. Um, I am going to have talked to you about the synchronously in class. So if you are in class, you don't need to watch this unless you want to review or it's a good way to go back over it or stuff like that. But if you couldn't make it to synchronous in class, um, I've got the PowerPoint posted on Canvas, and then I'll also have this video embedded so that you can listen to the lecture this way. You can pause it, you can go back over things, and if you have any questions, you can email me or bring them up in class discussions or stuff along those lines when you are able to make it to class. So this is kind of like to help you through that kind of synchronous part of it, if this makes sense. And, uh, and what this lecture itself is going to do is get us into like the very, very beginnings of, of European and Latin American history and society and how they interacted with each other and stuff along those lines. Um, now, normally we'd go like even further back. We'd talk a lot more about the Mayas, Incans, and Aztecs. We'd talk some about the feudal system and stuff along those lines in Europe. But um, uh, the COVID-19 situation and stuff like that has led us um, to a place where we're about two hours shorter of instruction uh, than we would have had on any given day. Now, some of that's gotten back because of block and stuff like that, or sorry, than any given week, almost two hours shorter instruction than we would have had in any given week. Um, and some of that's gotten back because of block, but others of it's still lost and the fact that we're not like live and stuff along those lines. So this is, and some of the instruction will be kind of abbreviated and stuff like that. Um, and uh, Matheny and I will, uh, will talk about that a lot in class as we go through um, and like what the differences are and stuff along those lines. Um, and so what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to talk to you about the socioeconomic and cultural makings, really the idea of hierarchy, how we got to hierarchy stuff along those lines um, in the in the first few slides of this or in the next few minutes of this lecture okay now, um, since this is the first experience you've had with a Doran lecture, um, one of the things um, you probably don't know about my lectures at all is that they're always going to begin with a thesis. Um, the reason for this is to model behavior. Um, uh, you guys are, you know, in this class doing the work of historians, and um, as somebody who is did my job to teach you that work, um, it's important for me to to also show you that behavior. So, in the same way that like you will be consistently asked to write theses to give your opinions on history and stuff like that, um, I could tell you anything. I could start with anything. I have thousands of years of history to cover. And so I'm going to have crafted a thesis to be arguing to be you what I'm arguing to kind of guide you through the entire course, if that makes sense. And each lecturer will have a thesis um, at the beginning here. Now, my theses will be complex. They'll be multi-sentence theses. You're not allowed to do that. You need to get a master's degree to do that or so. Um, but essentially what I'm going to be arguing to you in this lecture, and, and, and really think of it this way, is at the end of the lecture, you should be able to back up these sentences. You should be able to say like, okay, the first sentence he said, blah, blah, blah. The second ones are not the end of the lecture, maybe the end of the lesson after we've done the reading and stuff like that too. Um, what I'm going to be arguing is this, is that the turmoil caused by the fall of Rome led to chaos, which was replaced with a really rigid hierarchical system, is which pe peasants routinely gave up freedoms to be protected by the upper classes, okay? These freedoms could be extreme, like they gave up the freedom of movement, for example, um, in order to be able to hide behind the city walls when the marauding knights came, right, and the Vikings and stuff like that. Um, during this time in Europe, class and religion served as the main methods of social organization. And while they weren't necessarily giving up the same freedoms and protections as Latin America, class and religion are also serving as the main methods of social organization at this time there. Once Europeans made contact in the Americas, they began to look for ways to exploit its rich new natural resources. Um, things like timber and stuff like that had been lost by the Europeans. Um, a lot of it had been deforested and stuff like that. Um, and the people at the top of the European class period really saw a way to make even even more money and to get higher. And so they looked for a way to explore the, the rich resources of the Americas, which have some of the richest natural resources in the entire world. Um, at the same time that this is happening, the um, influence of religion is waning significantly. Um, science is becoming a new way of viewing the world, and all this is going to come to a headway in something we'll talk about more called the Enlightenment. Um, and the goal of the Enlightenment was to further the technology of European society, but instead what that led to uh, was the foundation of rigid race-based economic structures in the Americas and class-based economic structures in Europe that would lead to racism, prejudice, and conflict since the late 18th century. And aside from the things that you might be thinking about in the United States, even though we're not really talking about that um, as much because this is European and Latin American history, there's some that's rooted in this, um, we're talking about race-based and class-based conflict um, in the Americas, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina. Um, we're talking about class-based conflict throughout history in Europe, in the Industrial Revolution, um, in World War I, um, in, the, in the, you know, the Nazism and stuff that came up along those lines. I mean, all this was based in and on this, or at least that's what this lecture is going to be arguing.
Okay, so uh, in the first part of um, the uh, thesis, I said that there was turmoil created by the fall of the Roman Empire. And basically what I've got to argue to you is this in a couple pictures here, right? This is Rome, okay, in Europe, okay? This is a map of Europe right now. As I said, the first day, if you don't know what Europe looks like and Latin America looks like today, go take the map quiz for fun when you get bored. It's not really a quiz. Go look at a map of Europe. I've given you some links um, that will give you an idea or give you some, like, fun, like, you know, place the country here or match the country here, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to get an idea of, of where where it is we're actually studying. Normally, I'd give you an actual quiz, but that's, like, impossible to do online. Um, so, with online things. So, instead, I'm saying, like, you know, go get bored and, and play map trivia after looking at it, learn a map of Europe, learn a map of Latin America, see if you can beat my entire, like, going through Europe perfectly, dragging the countries there in under 90 seconds. If you can do that, we'll be impressed. All right, anyway, this is a, uh, a, a map of the Roman Empire, okay? And we're going back to about uh, 116 um, CE here. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's massive, and it encompasses, like, most of the known world, and it makes up everything. And here's the thing, um, is it, it, at least most of the known world to European and Latin American, or European history at this time, we're not into the Latin American part there, we'll get there in a second, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, too. But it makes up most of the known European world at this time. Um, and, uh, and what it leads to, if you're not aware of this and hadn't thought of this, is aside from a common language, a common currency, a common road system, a semi-common religion, uh, common ways of dealing with things, courts, law, justice, arts, etc., etc., blah, 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 okay? It comes crashing down to a halt around 476 CE in the West, a little bit later in the East. Um, but the West is what we're focused on here, the Western Empire more than anything else. It comes crashing to a halt, and there is this massive, massive massive void, okay, of lawlessness, of, you know, people being able to do whatever they want, of, like, you know, technology literally going backwards, um, et cetera, et cetera. You have these old aqueducts. People are like, hey, those are cool, but we don't know how to work them. We don't know what they're used for anymore and stuff like that. Um, it'd be kind of like if, you know, you had this iPhone sitting there, but you didn't know how to turn it on and it couldn't connect to the internet. It just kind of sat there, right? Stuff like that. Um, when the Roman Empire comes crashing down, and something's got to step up and fill that void. Okay. And what I argued to you in the very beginning is the thing that's going to step up and fill that void um, is uh, is going to be two things. Um, on one side, it's going to be class and um, and stuff like that. In other words, who can protect people, who has the food, um, who has um, all the land near the food that can protect the people. Therefore, they're the person that you want to have as the noble or the king, and everybody else is their peasant and stuff like that, right? Um, and that leads to a natural system with people at the top and people at the bottom. Um, the other thing that's going to step in and fill the void, aside from the class protections and stuff like that that we talked about, and people kind of making these deals where they give up freedom and protection that I said at the beginning, the other thing that's going to step up really hardcore and fill the void is the Christianization of Europe, okay? Um, it's going to begin in Rome. It's going to spread um, through France, or sorry, in Italy and stuff like that. It's going to spread through France even when Rome's still alive. Um, and around. Um, the, the Gauls or the Franks are the first um, people to convert to Christianity, something they're very, very proud of. Um, the Lithuanians are the last people in Europe to convert to Christianity, something they're also very, very proud of. Um, it's going to go all around through England, Spain. Um, it's going to make its way to Eastern Europe a little bit later, etc., etc. Um, and eventually, um, as I said, it's going to be all the way until 1385 um, when Lithuania um, is finally Christianized. It takes them a while to learn, or not them, it takes the Catholics a while to learn how to, how to Christianize Lithuania. They keep sending envoys with a bunch of money saying become Christian, and the Lithuanians keep taking it. And then the minute the Pope's envoy leaves, they're like, eh, it's like we're pagan again, but we still have all your money, and now we're willing to fight you for it. So they, they finally get it down around 1385 or so. Um, and this, this is the one unifying void. This and the system that is slowly set up, this system of feudalism that involves class structure and hierarchy and stuff like this. And these are the things that step in to like Europe at this time. Now, what do we mean by hierarchy? In case you haven't heard that word, well, there you go. There it is right there, the, a clip of the thing. It is a noun, a system of organization in which people and groups are ranked one above the other according to status and authority, okay? Um, and you can see there are two main hierarchies in medieval Europe. They're actually going to be even more blurred um, in... Uh, in um, uh, Mesoamerica and your ancient American um, civilizations that we talked about, um, whereas the religious leader is, is pretty much the same as the... Um, 
the um, worldly leader or stuff like that. And there is a god at the top and stuff like that. So they're going to be even more blurred there. Um, but in Europe, you're going to have um, two key hierarchies that grow out of that. As I said, the first one, um, thanks to the fall of Rome and the need for freedom and protection and, and the worldly stuff like that, the prince, the duke, the earl, the classmen, the serfs down at the bottom. And then the religious one, the the pope, the rulers, the stuff like the, the priests, um, the monks, etc., etc. Um, and this is going to become ingrained... Um, in European society for, for nearly a thousand years. Um, in Mesoamerican society, it's just kind of the way things are. Um, there's no like actual like thing up top where like God is saying on down, this is the way things are. It's just kind of always worked this way. There's been a king, he's done things. There's been a priest, he's done things. There's been people down who fought, they've done things. And then all the people that farmed down below who kind of got crapped on by the people up top and stuff like that. In European society, the belief is that God has purposely ordained these people and put them all there. In other words, so if you're king, you're king because God has decided that, like, you are the best person to put on the throne of Spain, okay? This gets particularly comical when, thanks to a bunch of inbreeding, you get, like, King Charles II of Spain, who's impotent um, and incontinent and can barely speak. But, hey, you know, according to the, the structure and order of things, he was put on the throne by God to rule Spain, which means either God has a sick sense of humor or really doesn't like Spain, etc., etc. You can make a call on that, okay? But this is how people viewed things. And it is so ingrained that it is everywhere in medieval society and medieval religion. We take the quintessential medieval work um, of, uh, of this. You may have heard of this. It's called the Divine Comedy, also known a part of it as Dante's Inferno, right? And everything is ordered to the point of a hierarchy. Even hell, which is supposed to be like the antithesis of this, is an anti-hierarchy with like, you know, a few people down at the bottom who are super evil and like, like, you know, people who are kind of bad up top and stuff like that. And everything is about order. We're not reading, like, Macbeth and Shakespeare, but you'd see it in that. Like, you know, the time that they kill a king in William Shakespeare's plays and Macbeth or, or Caesar or something like that, um, everything goes crazy. That night there are rumors that, like, you know, um, uh, you know, mice start eating owls and, like, horses, like, tear each other apart. Why? Because you messed with the natural hierarchy order of things and, and screwed with God's system and stuff like that, Okay. So this is the key part of like ingrained early European society. And now they're going to kind of meet with the Americas and move it there. And that's going to lead to a bunch of the conflict and the prejudices and the racism that's going to come up um, over the next like couple hundred or a few hundred years here. Okay, so now that I've given you some like, you know, history, shown you some maps, some graphs, defined hierarchy, or charts, sorry, um, defined hierarchy, stuff like that. Um, we need to talk about three things, really. Like, how did we get to hierarchy? Um, who goes where in the hierarchy? And finally, how the European hierarchy comes to the Americas and what that leads to and stuff like that. Um, and uh, the first thing is, is really, as I said, is how do we get to the hierarchy? Um, and to do this, we got to go back. Now, I told you that, like, you know, Rome fell and, like, they need to replace Rome and stuff like that. But, like, if you're an enterprising person who was thinking during that time rather than just kind of writing notes, you might have been thinking, right, okay, but, like, you know, why does Rome fall automatically lead to hierarchy? And, that, and that's what we need to talk about here. Okay, um, and one of the first people um, to to argue for a hierarchy is the is Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher of the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, like you know, founders of modern Western philosophers teaching family, right? Um, and his goal was to philosophically argue how Greeks were superior, right? Um, now, Aristotle was not doing this on the basis of race or anything like that. Aristotle was doing this on the basis of nationality, okay? And he was doing it on the basis of na nationality for a really, really, really key reason, okay? Um, it was mainly based in and around enslavement. But enslavement in the ancient world was not based around race. It was based basically around nationality based on losing in a war. So in other words, it was based on nationality, like, in other words, if your nation was conquered by another nation, they would take you, they would enslave your people, they would kill a bunch of them, they would rape your women, etc., etc., blah, 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 blah. Um, this was one reason you got people to, like, kind of fight to the death, etc., etc. So Aristotle was trying to philosophically justify the temporary enslavement of Greek prisoners of war. And note temporary, this was never hereditary or anything like that, like the enslavement that you might know of the America, or in, in, in Brazil and and um, the Caribbean and the United States and other parts of the Americas and stuff like that. This was never hereditary, right? Um, but the temporary, he's trying to justify the temporary enslavement of, of Greek POWs from their, like, improbable victories. And the Greek city-states had small armies, and they kept winning, so people kept, he kept saying, oh, well, clearly we're better, blah, 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 so therefore we should be the type of the hierarchy. And what this led in Aristotle was something called climate theory, um, though nothing like climate change and stuff like that. Um, what he argued was that climate impacted human traits. Now, um, he was kind of right in that, like, over the course of, like, a million years, 
linear plus evolutionary range, like climate does impact human traits to a certain extent. Like, you know, um, people, for example, who are likely to get sickle cell anemia um, have that because they have a gene that's more likely to prevent them from getting malaria because they lived in a climate place where malaria was a big thing. And so climate does impact human traits, stuff like that, right? Um, hereditarily. But that's not what Aristotle thought. Aristotle thought that, like, if you were warm in the sun, you were, you know, better. If you were in the regions that were too hot, then you were baked too much, quote unquote. If you were too cold, then you weren't baked evenly, etc., etc. He actually thought the same thing about gender. He thought that, like, you know, a male child was baked in the womb appropriately, whereas a female child was, like, overbaked or underbaked or something like that. That's literally what he tried to argue here, okay? Um, and he determined that the Greeks were superior because they were, like, baked evenly, etc., etc. And that was the original, like, point of view for hierarchy in Western civilization, okay? Now, Greek ideas went down to the Romans, okay? And then some of this came from the Bible because large parts of the Bible were written down when the Romans and the Jews were interacting quite regularly. And people like Paul, who wrote large swaths of the Bible, Paul of Tarsus, were in fact Roman citizens. Little plug, if this thing interests you, take my uh, IB World Religions class in uh, two years. It's really, really fun, and uh, we have a good time, etc., etc., but more on that later. Anyway, back to the actual lecture. Um, uh, so, uh, um, with the Romans and, and the Jews and stuff like that interacting, um, large parts of the Bible were written down. They were written down um, where you had a system of hierarchy. Um, Paul continually refers to lines about slaves and masters, those at the top and those at the bottom. Um, on a side note, much of what Jesus of Nazareth was trying to do was, quote, help those at the bottom, but that part was conveniently annoyed when looking for biblical reasons behind that. And instead what people said was, okay, there are ideas for, like, you know, masters um, and slaves, people at the top, people at the bottom. Um, hierarchy is natural. In Roman society had hierarchy. They had patricians, equestrians, plebeians, etc etc um, much like your like medieval um, kind of class based thing so when Rome falls and Christianity rises hierarchy is really natural wait but what about Aristotle and stuff like that ah it only gets that much more natural because something occurs after the end of the Middle Ages and the fall of Rome and the kind of, you know, thousand years, 800 years plus of that, something called the Renaissance. And this is a rebirth of Greek and Roman ideas and a rebirth of learning. And this is when you get a new focus on like, oh, I don't know, reading, literature, the humanities, etc., etc., ideas of humanism, blah, blah, blah. And one of the things that they rediscover are the works of Aristotle. And this lends credence to what they already know is that hierarchies are natural, hierarchies are then are there. Um, but from the progress, from the point of view of these Europeans at this point, they've progressed. And so instead of it being the Greeks at the top, there are they're ready to find kind of new hierarchies, if that makes sense. But who goes where in this hierarchy? And this is probably the most important thing to discuss. Now, before I say this, I do want to say one thing about our hierarchy, because who goes where becomes really important in this part. Keep in mind that in a hierarchy, it will almost always create an us versus them mentality with the people involved, okay? Um, if you uh, if you did stuff at all, like during civics with animal farm and stuff like that, even if it's not a like multiple tiered hierarchy, you have like the proletariat at the top and the, or sorry, the bourgeoisie at the top and the proletariat down at the bottom, stuff like that. Okay, so it almost always leads to an us versus them mentality, okay? Um, and when Rome falls, um, race or religion have almost nothing to do with it. It's almost all about class. It's literally who has access to food and shelter, who has access to swords, who can be protected from marauding knights and then Vikings and other people, who cannot, etc., etc. And the people who cannot move near the people who can, they agree to work their land, they agree to work their food, they agree to do things for them, they give up all sorts of different freedoms in order to gain protections. And if you think the idea of giving up a freedom in order to gain a protection is like something that we don't do anymore you have no idea what you're talking about okay airport security is the perfect example of that you are not allowed according to the u.s constitution to search and seize or search and seize things without probable cause yet we give up that freedom every time we used to get on an airplane prior to covid but we give up that freedom every time we get on an airplane um in order to uh to feel protected and that's exactly what these type of people were doing here they found it to be more kind of an everyday life and death situation if this makes sense this right here is going to become the class hierarchy that will dominate Europe for over 2,000 years. When he's writing the Communist Manifesto in 1848, that's literally how Karl Marx starts and Frederick Engels. The history of Europe is the history of class struggle. Okay, so that's the European part. Now, next part in the hierarchy. Um, that's the social part. Now let's get to kind of the religious part and stuff like that. Once Christianity begins to us versus them becomes like those who are Christian and those who aren't. 
okay? Um, there is a hierarchy within itself um, of, like, a pope and stuff like that, and that is important to understanding, like, the intricacies of old-school European history. But since this course is mainly the French Revolution on, and the French Revolution really represents the death of, like, the massive, massive, massive influence of religion, it's only somewhat influential after that, um... Since that happens, um, it, it's not as important to talk about the actual um, hierarchy within Christianity as much as it is to talk about the hierarchy of religions. And it was believed that, like, you know, Christians were superior to other people, particularly Jews and Muslims, right? Um, it's considered massively unacceptable at this time to find labor and slaves for Christians to enslave another Christian. Um, that's one of the, the things that comes up, and that's one of the ways they justify their, their um, kind of, uh, you know, hierarchy and putting themselves above other people as Christians, don't do that to other Christians, blah, 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 okay? Um, and in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, um, with there not being a huge Muslim population or anybody other than Christians, what this means is massive amounts of anti-Semitism, pogroms, scapegoating of the Jews. Um, direct enslavement of the Jews was fairly rare, but scapegoating, killing, um, using them um, for like you know some of the worst things possible, um, making uh, prejudicial claims against them. We'll talk tons about this as the year goes on. Tons about this. This will become a sad, common theme in European history. Okay, but outside of Europe. Um, you know, looking for people to, like, conquest over, and, you know, Christians, again, not supposed to fight and enslave Christians and stuff like that, other Christians, although it did happen, they're not supposed to, technically, right? Um, outside Europe, um, the first main means of conflict outside of Europe occurred in places like the Middle East and North Africa, and occurred um, predominantly, um, or, or occurred um, with um, areas that had become predominantly Muslim, okay? Um, sometimes with the Muslims attacking the Christians in, like, the Battle of Tours with Charles the Hammer Martel, if you know what that means, you're a huge history dork, and I probably really love you, good for you. If not, that's perfectly fine. You'll be fine in this class, no worries. Um, to other times with, like, um, you know, uh, the uh, Crusades and stuff like that. Um, the problem is, is that, like, um, this continues to go very poorly for the Christians who see themselves as superior to Muslims and Jews, etc., etc., but but history and, and, and the results are not really proving this, okay? Um, instead, what they're proving is that, like, um, a lot of those areas are technologically advanced, and to be honest, they keep cracking the European and Christian's butt for a long time. And if you actually think about it, although like Europe will eventually come to kind of dominate the world, that's not true until some really random things happen in the like 15, 16, 1700s. It's really the Middle East and the, and Asia and and Mongolia and stuff like that that are absolutely like advanced, like both like um, uh, militarily and technology and stuff along those lines, right? Um, uh, but all the Europeans are really doing are, are kind of fighting to kind of stalemates with their, their Muslim neighbors and stuff like that. There's not a whole lot of like, you know, um, uh, there's, there, the, there's not a whole lot of like, like prejudice based on race. There's prejudice based on religion. There's prejudice based on nationality, stuff like that. Okay. Um, and nobody's really getting the other hand over each other. Okay, um, and eventually um, Islam starts to kind of look elsewhere away from Europe and stuff like that. Um, they, they're able to take over some parts of Eastern Europe, particularly in the Balkans area and stuff along those lines. Um, and then there, uh, there's Sub-Saharan, uh, there's conquests of Sub-Saharan Africa and Islam begins to take uh, like various um, areas that are predominantly Muslim at that point. Um, and I don't like to say, sorry, I shouldn't have said Islam, I should say the predominantly Muslim areas. Religions don't actually do anything. These are people acting in the name of religions. That's just me mis speaking as I'm lecturing. Um, having said that, to go back would be like, you know, killing six minutes worth of work here, so we're just going to correct ourselves as we talk. Anyway, um, in the predominantly Muslim um, areas of that time, um, which are looking to explore because they are way advanced past the Europeans, um, they find themselves going south, and they find themselves, um, um, you know, taking much conquest through, like, um, Slavic Eastern Europe Arts parts as well as sub-Saharan African conquest parts. And as Western Europeans um, academically kind of move closer and closer to that, um, transculturation occurs, and that's when two cultures kind of get the ideas um, and thoughts and, and prejudices and stuff going each other. And the idea becomes basically that, like, okay, the Western Europeans and the Muslims have fought to a stalemate because they're fairly equal and stuff like that, but that clearly means because they, you know, have, um, you know, 
the, the, the same has not been said of like the Eastern Europeans, the Slavs, as well as like the Sub-Saharan um, people in Africa and stuff like that. Therefore, like those people deserve to have prejudice against them. And it's actually some of the like Muslim scholars moving through that world that are the first to kind of echo Aristotle before the Renaissance has even happened in Europe. And then as that happens, this kind of furthers the idea um, uh, in European society, etc., etc., if that makes sense. Okay, last part. European hierarchy comes to the Americas, right? Okay, um, so uh, so is European society, and this is the this is this is where we really need to understand the academic part of it, if this makes sense. As European society progressed through times, religion. Um, fell out of popularity. Um, this is due to corruption, wars, politics, more corruptions, more wars, even more corruption, a couple more wars, and even more corruptions. Guys, at its height, we have um, the Pope um, being elected, Leo X, who's one of the most despicable people ever to elect to the papacy, who has a boy painted gold um, to uh, to represent like you know his triumph papacy thing, and the boy dies of lead poison a few days later. But Leo doesn't notice because he's in the middle of like a five night dinner that involves like seventy some courses including little naked boys jumping out of cakes i'm not making this stuff up it was so corrupt right that eventually religion just kind of started to fall apart and fall off this is what led to martin luther and the reformation if you've heard of that good for you if not you should probably read a little bit more but that's again stuff that like we would have gone into but we don't have time to because we lost so much like last time and stuff like that the point is this is silent science slowly starts to become the processing method of the day okay this starts at the end of the late middle ages with the foundations of the universities below in Paris in the 1200s, ideas like Occam's Razor, it gets furthered by the Renaissance. It's not universally accepted until the Age of the Enlightenment, which really is around the late 16, early 1700s. And this is the area in European history where it's believed that science starts to triumph over religion. Okay, that's really key. You should make sure you got that down, you write that down, you know what the Enlightenment is, you have a working definition of the Enlightenment. We will talk about the Enlightenment a ton more after we get through kind of the early Americas, like meeting and conquest and stuff like that. Okay, this led to a massive explosion in science and learning known as the scientific revolution. Okay, this is Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, um, Galileo, Newton, etc., etc. Um, these led to massive breakthroughs in the way Europeans view the world and thought about the world. This led to the age of exploration, etc., etc. This also led to a new way of wanting to view and classify the world, putting people into categories. And they did that as a way of labeling things, not necessarily meant to be a bad way, but all those kind of Latin terms we get, like, you know, uh, homo sapien and stuff like that. Um, all are coming out of the Enlightenment. Let's label and classify everything so we can label the world. And here's the thing is, regardless of how innocent that started, eventually what that leads is people placing classifications into a method they already knew, and that method is hierarchy. Okay, and so what happens is that people start pl placing classifications of the races. And this leads directly to the idea that some races are better than the others. Now that we've started, now that the people have started classifying things and talking about that, they're going to then do what they've naturally always done, which is put them in a hierarchy. Okay, but that doesn't lead to necessarily like problems and racism and prejudice that will dominate the Americas for over 400 years. It actually has to be taken even further. And this is part of what you're going to read about once we're done talking about this thing. Okay, But at the exact same time that this is happening, Spain and Portugal are beginning to get their exploration of the New World, okay? And there are learned men like Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal, who like, you know, and I say learned in quotes because like they're learned for the day, but they're not the science that we would agree on by any method today, right? Um, and they have overseas colonies, and they have... Um, uh, the need for labor and they really want to exploit the riches of the new world as we talked about in the like early thesis at the beginning as I said they really wanted to exploit those riches okay um and so they needed labor to do it and at first they went with kind of voluntary labor and then when the voluntary labor started to round out they started looking around and like they started looking at these new ideas of the enlightenment and they started looking at classification and they started saying okay well naturally like you know these people are above and these people are below and so therefore you know we don't need to worry about the religion and stuff like that or the nationalities or stuff like that no 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 no, no. the people above um, have the quote unquote duty and the right you might have heard of white man's burden we're nothing like that idea yet but it's still that idea in its early early infancy like 300 400 years before that but like people at the top have the have the i don't know necessarily duty part at this point but the right to exploit and use people at the bottom and stuff like that um and this becomes the economic justification that's why i labeled this like socio-cultural socioeconomic and cultural makings this becomes the economic justification for what would lead to prejudice 
and labor exploitation and slavery in the Americas. It's really important to keep in mind that the ideas of racism came afterwards. The economic necessity was there first, and then they took the idea of hierarchy, and then they took that into, okay, well, one is better than the other, right? But this is the race hierarchy that will dominate the Americas for over 400 years from, where, from when, the, when contact goes until now. So hopefully the point of this lecture in 30 minutes as it ended up being by the time I talked and you know added stuff and stuff like that gave you an idea of how we got the two systems that are really going to come to dominate Europe and Latin America over the course of this course. Um, we're going to read a little bit more about this in um, an excerpt from a book called Stamp from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi which is kind of the history of racist ideas in the Americas. Um, and then um, Athene over the course of the next couple days will also be talking to you about some of the origins of like racism and the hierarchies that we got to in the West because all these are really important to understanding the ideas of the Enlightenment and then the French Revolution and then the various class and race and prejudicial struggles that will come up um, throughout the course of this course as we go forward. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, if you were there for class, use this to review and stuff like that. If you weren't, use this to get an idea of what we were doing and then go read that extra from Stamped as it tells you to on Canvas, or Stamped from the beginning as it tells you to on Canvas. Um, and feel free to email me if you have any questions, follow-ups, thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, have a good one and I will talk to you guys again like this soon and hopefully I'll see you in synchronous learning as well.